Greetings to all hamburger kids. Today we have another English part with Professor Patrick Jurison. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, you do, Martin. Patrick is uh, from Netherlands. He's a professor of the sustainable finance, sustainable financing healthcare. Yeah. Or how, how would you? What actually? Would, how would you define it? I would say healthcare finance and healthcare systems. Sustainable. What exactly does it mean? Sustainable. Oh, okay. I think um, uh, <coughs> sustainable. I would say uh, has three parts. So one would be it needs to be financially sustainable, meaning that it doesn't eat up all expenses for other public services. For example, that's one. A second uh, would be uh, that we should have an adequately well-trained workforce. So we should have the workers to provide the healthcare services. It's increasingly important. A third is that uh, it should be uh, sustainable from a societal perspective, uh, meaning that living up to the needs of the people or the expectations of the people, uh, meaning also things like it, 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 it holds up to the level of solidarity uh, a co country wants to, to shoulder in its health system. So I think these three things. So uh, financially sustainable, um, uh, sustainable on your personal resources or worker resources, and also being societal uh, um, uh, sustainable, meaning reflecting the values and, and the uh, preferences of the people in, in a certain system. We, we like to be very pessimistic about the Slovak uh, healthcare system. Uh, you are studying a lot of system around, systems around the world. Would you say that global healthcare, especially in Western states, in, is becoming less sustainable? Well, I would say uh, the services are better uh, than 15 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years ago or 50 years ago. So that's a reason for optimism. Um, but uh, having said that, I do think that um, the way we tackle sustainability problems, uh, that is by providing more efficiency or more efficient services, has somehow its limits. And uh, I wouldn't say we are there yet, but we are, you know, we are reaching the limits uh, to simply say, okay, your efficiency will keep the system sustainable. Meaning to say basically that somewhere in the future, countries need to make choices, politically tough choices, on things like out-of-pocket payments, higher out-of-pocket payments, or lower benefits, or those kind of, those kind of things. So, so, so we cannot, you know, we cannot with only being more efficient, solve all our sustainable sustainability problems. In, in Slovakia, we have a kind of similar system compared to uh, Netherlands. Uh, you have probably more more competitive system. You have a choice of let's call it products or plans. Yeah. Choice yeah. of plans we don't have. Many people say, me including, that uh, the reform in Slovakia was not finished in 2006 because of the change of government yeah. and similar other things. And currently there is a like discussion, are we going to finish it in Slovakia or are we going revert back to the uh, unified system with a single insurer? Is, is, yeah. is, is, a, is a similar discussion in the, in the Netherlands or you are generally okay with your system? Yeah, I think we're generally okay, but uh, having said that, after uh, actually uh, 15 years, but, but longer than that actually, uh, going into a direction of regulated competition, or managed competition uh, with choice, I think we are also reaching uh, the limits of that part. It doesn't mean that there's, that you know, we want another system. I think there's definitely not, 
you know, there's no reason to, to, to want that, I think. And there's also uh, not the political will to do that. Um, but you do see that after a long road, which actually started in 1986, uh, a gradual road of a blueprint reform based on the principle of managed competition, that after this very long road, uh, you now see that uh, we are nearing we are nearing somehow the institutional borders or the political will to go even further on that road. That's what you do see. Um, yeah, but I think the system all in all delivers quite good, especially from a financial perspective. And um, I don't see a change. I don't see a major change in, in, in at least in the next 10 years. Or so. The question is, uh Isn't the demographic change, which is uh, fueling the problems in all major Western economies, uh, too big to be solved by uh, a simple tweaks in any system? Uh, don't you think we will see a, a major shakeup of, of uh, social and healthcare systems in the, I don't know, I want to say upcoming one to three years, but let's say 10, 15, okay. 20 years? Yeah, yeah. It depends. I mean, it could be, right? And and especially uh, society, especially also Dutch society, is ve very vulnerable um, because to aging because we have such a huge long-term care sector. And long-term care sector is actually for those over 80 years of age, right? So it's very, very vulnerable. But I often tell students, if the United States can shoulder uh, 80% of GDP for a healthcare system, which is arguably, well, let, let, what shall we say? Not very efficient, not delivering to all American citizens the same amount of care, uh, but the economy can shoulder that. Um, I, I would predict that European economies, well, maybe we shouldn't want to go to 18%. I wouldn't, you know, I would be against that, but I think we definitely can have another two, 3% of GDP growth in the next decade, 20 years or so, without major adverse effects for the economy. Of course, what's much more important is, do you spend those additional resources, which I think will come because the people want it, do you spend them on the right services and, and the right healthcare that, that really delivers? I think that's in the end, um, and much more important if, if you think about structural sustainability. Maybe there is a, there is a question, what actually should the healthcare, healthcare system deliver? In terms of, uh, we, we know that the healthcare system has only, plays only partial role in prolonging life. Yeah. Things, things like yeah. culture, food yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. whatever yeah. Pay, play a huge difference. So. What part do you think should be focused on uh, delivering like uh, hard healthcare yeah. uh, advancements yeah, yeah. and what part yeah. like kind of yeah. consumer yeah. experience? Yeah. Yeah. So I think in the end, uh, healthcare should uh, deliver health or reduce the burden of disease and that we should uh, put the money where um, The, the highest burden of diseases and, and we should have an answer to that, right? Uh, and that's not always the case, <laughs> to be honest, right? So we did a study, for example, on uh, the marginal efficiency of Dutch hospitals and you see huge changes depending on the specific disease. So we tend to, I would say, we tend to overpay spectacular um, you know, high stake technologies uh, and that we tend to underspend on uh, say big uh, non-communable diseases that tend to become worse over the lifespan of people. So think about diabetes, uh, COPD, depression, uh, and that, you know, that, um, that's where a lot of the burden of disease is actually. Uh, it's not so sexy as doing a heart transplant, obviously. <laughs> uh, but if you want that the systems uh, 
reduce you know those burden of diseases and, and make progress you should invest more in, in in those kind of areas i would say but is, is it a question of money because especially chronic chronic diseases or civilization diseases are closely related to the lifestyle and similar yeah. things i mean can the healthcare system i mean the doctors the nurses deliver their results Yeah, we need to because um, because if you start with say diabetes and you continue with your lifestyle and all the stuff, uh, you end up with uh, end stage renal disease, and it's usually expensive. <laughs> so in the end, it's also rather uh, simple that if we um, uh, limit, uh, uh, I mean, if we treat those kind of diseases well down the road we will also reduce reduce costs so for example i have this assignment um in in in, in a smaller country uh, which has a huge uh, amount of people which are diabetic i think like 16 17 of the entire population and they also have six times as much uh, people on dialysis than than is the case relative in the netherlands now that is expensive Uh, so you know for me as a person who thinks about fiscal sustainability I think you know handling and managing uh, those diseases is is simply is, is also part of the solution um, and and simply telling people you know that they should change their lifestyle they should uh, but uh, we should we should do more than that because if you if you're a low-income person struggling with these diseases having mental issues, having stress, you know, you don't think about tomorrow <laughs> or the day after. So you're not so motivated on all these lifestyle issues. So I think I, I think that the healthcare systems should do a better job in managing those uh, those uh, diseases. The good good part uh, of the disease is uh, uh, the expenses are let's say predictable uh, if we are yeah. don't, not yeah. talking about yeah. pandemics or yeah. similar yeah. shocks no, they, they are, are predictable they are, they are but for example there are some uh, external cost shock typically in Slovakia uh, the healthcare workers uh, received a huge rise uh, the past year I don't even remember the exact percentage but a lot of and generally in the whole Europe and especially in this part of Europe where we are lacking doctors and nurses There, there is like race uh, in between the, the states to rise uh, the wages of these workers. And my question is, for example, let's say in, in the Netherlands, is it possible that there is a decision during the year that, okay, now because uh, our doctors protest, we are going yeah. to rise their wages yeah. by 20%. Yeah. And if, how do you do it in, in budget terms? Okay, so, yeah, so, so we had the same. So we had a rise of 10%. Uh, in the university clinics and now also in the hospitals and that will trickle down to the nursing homes etc and uh, and I haven't seen such a rise in my income at least not from the uh, from a, from a wage agreement in my entire working life so you know so that's special uh, so we have a very um, we basically compensate so the Dutch system works like this we say uh, so the wages in the healthcare sector need to be in line with those in the private sector. So we look what are the wage increases in the private sector and all the wage agreements in the private sector and say it's like, well, let's say 10%, right? Then then the system will eventually say, okay, so we also need a 10% um, increase in the budgets of the healthcare sector, at least in the in the salary part of the healthcare sector, because they also need to pay 10%. Now there is a there is a, a backlog in there. But I, I mean, there's a time lag. Sorry, uh, because you know you give the salary increase now because of an outcry, because of strikes, etc. I mean that's not that different. I think maybe it's less intense. So, but it's not that different in the Netherlands. Uh, so you give the uh, salary um, increase, and of course the providers at the moment they don't have the money right there on the table. But the um, uh, uh, the reimbursements of the nominal part of the budget, so the the, the up updates because of inflation and salaries, will feed that amount of money in the next two three years or so into the budgets. So you upfront you have to find it. So so providers are actually very well 
protected, I would say, against you know these salary increases. But what I understood from your speech on uh, our event, uh, both insurers and providers in the Netherlands have decent buffers, financial buffers. Yeah. Is it right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. That, that's a big difference <laughs> compared yeah, 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 to Slovakia, yeah, yeah. where there's like yeah, zero yeah, reserves. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they can use these buffers to yeah. accommodate yeah. this kind of. Yeah, and of course, some some more than others, and of course, a buffer you can only spend it once. But yes, yes, I But think that is that is. Uh, That is a that is a difference, yeah. But uh, are these buffers, let's say, voluntary? They do it because it's uh, the way of doing business, or yeah, is it so, given by regulation? Uh, so insurance is by regulation, right? So there's strict oversight by the Dutch Central Bank and, of course, the international regulators of Solvency too. So they have to. Um, of course, you can debate uh, if they have to have such high solvency figures i i tend to think that the regulators are too strict here but you know knowing all these things about financial crisis and you know but maybe maybe not uh in the provider side it's basically the commercial banks so the commercial banks they gave out loans uh to providers to to develop new property uh and for them it's 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 a very simple calculation you know the more financial ranked a provider has you know the less risk if if a bank provides you for loan you know you do so they want simply that their loans are being paid back and in return they also ask uh, providers uh, to have substantial uh, uh, level of solvencies otherwise there will be no loans but we are talking also about public providers right In no, no, we, we're talking or about uh, uh, so the Dutch uh, system basically uh, the provider side in patient side is private non-profit so we're talking about private providers who can get into default which is of course different if you are a public provider because then you know the state is always there I assume or at least you know you're part of the state and assuming that the state cannot go into default is different uh, but they can you know there are separate uh, non-profit companies and, and with separate boards and they can go into default and uh, four hospitals in the Netherlands in the last decade did went into default because although we have strong solvencies it doesn't mean that we have a substantial amount of providers who have weak solvencies but on average we have Uh, strong solvency. But that's the point of having competition among providers. There are some winners yeah. and some yeah, losers. Exactly, exactly. And 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 one of the things where you can distinguish the winners from the losers is if you look at things like a strong balance sheet. So if, if there is a loser, what 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 happens with, with that? Well, four went into default, uh, and you should think about 80 hospitals. So four, I would say. Is, is Well, it's a substantial number on 80 hospitals, smaller ones, but still. Um, but uh, also typically there will be some kind of restructuring where neighboring hospitals come to save and to help and, and to kind of, you know, take up the mess and then make it part of their healthcare system, so to speak. Yeah, so it's not, it's not, um, I mean, there's a huge interest also from a public perspective and, and from, a, you know, a media perspective, basically, that uh, to support and to help. I mean, we don't we don't want to have like chaotic uh, hospitals running into all kind of troubles and then into default. I mean, that would be that would backfire to the healthcare system, to the politicians that, you know, that decided on the system. Etc. So there are all kinds of, you know, informal incentives and non-financial incentives to um, to help. And my last question: uh, My hypothesis in Slovakia is that if the Slovak system will continue its trajectory, we will have like two tracks. One track will be the public system, which will be uh, theoretically for free and for everybody, but in practice it will be more and more difficult to get decent services from them yeah. and uh, fully commercial second track yeah. Ser yeah. services will arise for people who are willing to 
pay in cash for any kind of services yeah. and many providers mm-hmm. will start running from the public system into the private system yeah. do you see any chance of developing such developing in uh, in Netherlands or the no system? I think I think you know I, one of my point is that if you have a public system a state-run system I don't know of any public state-run system uh, which increasingly has not a private parallel system uh, also in the Nordic countries you see this is on the rise um, and then of course you can discuss if that's so fair because it basically means that as you say uh, the rich people jump out and uh, you know the the strength of the public sector eases and the, or lessens and lessens and lessens uh, so I think it's, it's a very good asset for a country if you have a system where more or less everybody has access to let us say middle class services not like you know the 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 all the fringe benefits of of say the fully commercial sector which caters to uh, say the top 10 percent of society but decent middle class a little bit higher and that means that um uh, and I think we have that in the Netherlands, but for example, I, I guess also Germany up to a way. But I think we definitely have that in the Netherlands. So very few people feel that they have to jump out of the system. And I think on the ground that creates a level of fairness or that everybody gets the same treatment, that actually many um, uh, public sector systems do not provide, although they tell, they tell otherwise. Exactly. Exactly. So, are you, are you pessimistic about or pos- uh, or optimistic about the future? I'm always. I, I think. I mean. I think you you should look at you know where healthcare has come from. You know, and 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 we will grow. I mean, healthcare will grow, and we will become. You know, it will provide more nice services, and there is a huge willingness to pay, and there is also a huge opportunity for for innovators. So, I think from that perspective, I'm very optimistic. Great, great. I share share your opinion and I hope we are both right. (laughs) Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, hope to cooperate in the future. Thank you.